Well, a very uh, warm welcome to Bradford and uh, good afternoon to all of you. Um, we're moving now from geospatial information to a, a very different type of spatial information, something that uh, increasingly we are being called upon here in Bradford uh, to look at and to help with. And uh, of course the, the image there sort of alludes to one of the key things that we're also known for here in archaeological science is our, our major collections of human remains. So what I'm talking to you uh, this afternoon about is, is a, a, what we think of as quite a, an important legacy project um, uh, called Digitised Diseases and I'm going to take you through some of the, the workings of that project and some of the lessons learned. Of course the starting point for many in human osteology is actually the sort of uh, textbook information uh, which of course is really presenting information at its best in a 2D format. So the sort of uh, colour photographs, black and white photographs that of course are, are present in many of those important textbooks um, and many of them have some form of connection here in Bradford that uh, picture on the front of Don Ortner's book I'll be coming back to in due course. But our collections are very extensive, they're probably the largest collection within a UK archaeology department of uh, human skeletal material. We have more than 4,000 skeletons. Most of them come to us and we hold them on long-term loan. And of course, they range uh, in date um, from the Neolithic through to the mid-19th century. Of course, some notable examples within the collection include um, material from the Battle of Towton. And the team that we're looking at, Richard III, came here to look at the Battle of Trauma on those skeletons from the mass grave um, to compare them against those on Richard III. Of course, we also have other big assemblages, uh, assemblages that are particularly significant in the field of paleopathology, uh, collections including those from Chichester um, that relate to a medieval leprosarium. And over some um, 30 years, I would say, now, we've been looking at training up the next generation of, of osteologists. We have a dedicated MSc in human osteology and paleopathology. I did the precursor to that some time ago now, um, when it was linked with Sheffield. But we also have a lot of public engagement work and a lot of paleopathology um, uh, trainees on CPD courses. So you're getting a sense of the fact that one of the specialties here in Bradford is in uh, the training of um, the pathological uh, specimens. Now, of course, they represent a, a great deal of interest to many, but they are also particularly fragile. So they're very frequently called upon for uh, teaching and they're requested as part of research. And as you can well imagine, things like this osteosarcoma that uh, come from um, 19th century Wolverhampton uh, are very, very fragile indeed. Of course, compare that to some of the collections that are perhaps more widely accessible to the public and to medics. And again, you've got a, a problem of access. You've got a problem of being able to handle these things, manipulate them, look at them, in 3D. For me, um, also having a background originally in archaeological conservation, it was going to this conference and taking with, uh, with us a couple of papers that I'd helped supervise, um, looking at the sort of pressures that we face with some of our collections, um, particularly thinking about fragile specimens as I've just shown you that really were a, a, something of a catalyst when, of course, the technology caught up in being able to help us with that. So in 2010, we wrote a grant bid, um, a pilot project to um, JISC as part of their 2011 to 2013 content program. Um, and we were successful in securing funding for 
a project that we called From Cemetery to Clinic. Again, you can see there the site map for the medieval leprosarium from Chichester at St. James and St. Mary Magdalene. The great thing about being able to reevaluate material such as this using very uh, sensitive methods of 3D data capture meant that, of course, we were also extending our understanding of that collection. We were um, uh, able to identify probable leprous change in a further, um, uh, I think it was actually up to 11 specimens, 11 individuals. Um, the other important thing, and I'll come back to this in a moment, is that we were able to digitize um, uh, a very important historic collection of leprous um, uh, clinical radiographs. Okay, move forward from that essentially five-month project that we were able to accomplish quite a bit in, but it was still very much a pilot to us. And um, JISC launched their mass digitization program, and we were luckily, lucky enough to be funded alongside these other projects, including uh, British Geological Surveys, 3D printed fossils, uh, project uh, and things like the Wellcome Trust London uh, Medical Officer Health Reports. Um, really, by focusing on what is preserved, what survives in the archaeological record, we're able to take a, a subset of clinical information on um, diseased individuals. And of course, there we're focused on chronic disease that manifests in the skeleton. It's got to be present long enough for that bone change to occur. And we set up this project in conjunction with various partners, with um, uh, the Royal College of Surgeons of England um, in London, so the Hunterian Museum, the Wellcome Museum of Anatomy and Pathology, of course, historic med medical collections, as well as more uh, recent modern clinical uh, collections partnered also uh, with Museum of London Archaeology. Um, again, like us, specialists in, in the study of human remains, but with great access to, of course, the volumes of material that come up at excavation in London. Um, they had just gone through their amicable, amicable split with the Museum of London, um, and so we were able to maintain the museum as a, 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 an associate partner and to benefit from, of course, the collections that are housed there at the Centre uh, for Bioarchaeology. Okay, faced with obviously wanting to select type specimens, the best of the best, um, and to represent uh, conditions over probably 90 plus um, clinical um, uh, pathological abnormalities, we had to spend a fair bit of time, and you can see here Andy Holland and Tom Sparrow scratching their heads as to how we manage that volume of data in, in terms of ingesting um, that into a usable format that we could then output as a web-based uh, um, uh, content delivery system. Of course, um, uh, it's gone through many iterations. You might see there, that's version 10. A lot of um, uh, eye-opener to uh, uh, the likes of Chris and myself in terms of the fact that there's no single accepted standard for the classification of disease in, um, in paleopathological terms. And of course, if we were to simply adopt something like the WHO standard for disease classification, it doesn't really work wholly in um, dry skeletal specimens. So quite a lot of work initially thinking about how we structure this data th really with a view to, of course, making it um, something that is, is very user-friendly at the, at the other end of things. Initially in Bradford, we were basing our selection of material on our human osteology collections informed by that disease classification structure. Um, of course, I, I've mentioned already uh, very useful books in paleopathology that, of course, were a great starting point in, in presenting specimens that have been uh, well described. 
uh, such as this specimen um, uh, that I'm going to show you in a moment. Uh, but Becky Storm here and Emma Brown, together with a team in London, um, were very much responsible in that initial stage of selecting useful specimens, grading them as to their significance. Okay, um, Of course, that was considering whether they were a good type specimen, their fragility, their condition, therefore. And um, part of that was how well this responded in recording them digitally in three dimensions. So, of course, that digital documentation, that 3D documentation, is what I'm going to be largely sort of talking you through this afternoon. In London, we essentially had a parallel team um, working with the same kit, of course, focused on specimens that we didn't really have a great uh, deal of here in Bradford, looking for those um, known clinical and particularly unusual specimens. Um, and you see some of the team there led at um, uh, the Royal College by Sam Alberti and by Nasha Powers at MOLA. Of course, even with those three major collections, there are still gaps and we had to infill some of those with the help of some of these associate partners. Um, some great help from York uh, and from Historic Scotland, as well as, of course, ingesting things like the Chichester material from uh, the Novium. I've already uh, alluded to this uh, great value in, in having that, that focus at that scale um, to be able to re-analyze, reinterpret these pathological descriptions and clinical, uh, and, and essentially provide some form of clinical oversight, a clinical synopsis. So what were we doing? Well, as uh, again, I'll explain in a moment, um, the technology is moving at a very fast pace. We used, um, because uh, here at Bradford initially, we had the help of the Centre for Visual Computing. We used one of their 3D laser scanners, um, essentially a laser arm with a, um, a camera system that captures the laser stripe and it records it essentially in three-dimensional space with the um, benefit of trigonometry. Because we had one of those in-house already, it was logical that we purchased a, 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 a um, the same model for use by the London team. And what you can see is that um, as you build up this information um, through separate scan passes, you essentially build up a composite picture of that three-dimensional uh, space um, recorded uh, through that detailed data capture. It only records in grayscale, and of course the benefit to us in archaeology is often seeing material with the colour information, that surface texture information, because that is informative in terms of the burial conditions, it's informative in terms of the condition of that material, and particularly where you're talking about pathological uh, uh, specimens to be able to discriminate what is pathology from what is other forms of bone change. So we um, uh, used um, uh, our team in Bradford and in London to digitally document in three dimensions and then photograph, um, capture uh, photographic information to give us that colour texture. What you can see is through the process of the project, a single specimen would often travel through a number of different researchers' hands, and we had to keep uh, a real handle on that as we amassed what was essentially huge amounts of data, more than seven terabytes worth of data, which is equivalent to more than 93,000 individual scan passes and more than 41,000 individual texture photographs. So real methodological challenges in terms of data size Issues, of course, where we're dealing with bone that has inherent porosity, but also has the potential to be damaged in archaeological uh, terms. Okay, where you have that porosity, it creates problems for us with, of course, 
translating that digital data, that point cloud data, into a 3D surface mesh. Um, trabecular bone doesn't scan well, and the enamel of teeth don't scan very well if we're dealing with very heavily stained material that comes from archaeology, um, that also poses problems. And these are very three-dimensional objects, okay? So there is that benefit of a laser arm with this sort of material, but even there, it can't see around corners and into very detailed undercut surface topography. So many different challenges. Now, in the initial pilot, we had um, the opportunity to trial a number of different output methods, different output formats. We used a proprietary method initially um, uh, based on Hassan Ugale. Remember, I mentioned visual computing. Hassan Ugale is a chair in visual computing here in Bradford with a lot of experience of data decimation um, and an interest in uh, for instance, the 3D representation of facial uh, um, uh, expression. So he's done a lot of work in conjunction with UK Borders Agency in terms of facial image capture. Um, and the technique that we output in that first pilot uh, project was essentially a, a variant on his PDE method um, that was essentially managed by um, a company, Tangentix, which was a spin-out from Bradford. So essentially a proprietary method, which in itself has problems, as we know, down the line in terms of data accessibility and archiving. Of course, as I've mentioned, um, um, the color texture information is very important. That PDE method with, with uh, using Silverlight, uh, uh, served by Tangentix, did, didn't support the color texture information. So we had to get around it in other ways, using um, uh, um, uh, object movies, for instance, to present that. So upscale to, of course, digitized diseases, and, and the color texture information was seen as all important. Um, so the process that was undertaken by the team of texturers, visual artists in visual computing, uh, was essentially a process of, of continuing the alignment, continuing the whole filling process, as you can see here, using software such as Maya and Mudbox. Um, Mudbox eventually then to uh, take the UV mapped uh, color texture information and then represent it on the 3D um, uh, bone surface as captured. So, of course, as a learning resource, it's really important. Um, we see it as something that, of course, is, is valuable for students to actually take away with them, to be able to manipulate and understand in three dimensions those specimens. Um, it's something that, of course, JISC were really uh, keen that we made openly accessible and freely available. So we were using Creative Commons licensing to serve these, uh, these 3D models. Um, now, of course, there are various aspects to this. There is the downloaded content, the higher resolution content that, of course, is served uh, up on tablet devices for private study and, of course, can be incorporated into things like virtual learning environments and bone quizzes. Um, there, incidentally, is Professor Keith Manchester, who's probably more of a whiz these days with his iPad than I am. Um, that was his eureka moment, seeing the potential for, for students in learning paleopathology. Okay, this is my little visual prompt to go off piste here and to take you to the um, the website. This is live. This is www.digitiseddiseases.org. And uh, just to take you into, of course, this is pulled up through the disease classification structure on the left-hand side here, and we'll take you into this model and we'll actually view it using the online viewer, which takes a little moment to upload. 
it uploads as a grayscale silhouette, a uh, uh, black and white silhouette rather, uh, initially, and then as you move it, you bring up that color texture information. And as you can see here, this is a wired specimen, so one of the specimens from the Royal College of Surgeons showing that neoplastic uh, uh, disease. Of course, we can pull up information that uh, details that substructure uh, that we had, uh, that we invested all that time in right at the outset, and the pathological descriptions that go alongside it. Um, the other aspect um, to that is, of course, you can download the content um, to your desktop. And if we go back to presentation, um, you've got uh, some models still at the moment that we don't have viewable online. This uh, uh, a benign neoplastic condition here. Um, but you can still download the, the content, the higher resolution content for your use. As I've said, it's um, got that Creative Commons attribution, but we are basically, because of some of our partners like the Royal College of Surgeons who have modern material that falls under the human tissue authorities conditions, we do um, basically uh, restrict that use to online content. So it is a born digital resource and that is a crucial element to the way in which we expect people to use this. So although I've said no, we've said no 3D printing, I'm going to sort of illustrate how that potential is something that we do uh, hope to take forward with select specimens in due course. Okay, so I've mostly been focusing on the 3D content, but a large amount of uh, the initial pilot project was also concerned with these historic radiographs, some 460 odd historic clinical radiographs coming from Ethiopia and from India um, that we were able to digitize um, with our X-ray digitization kit and to be able to serve that with a, a bespoke viewer. Uh, and there's more information that we're working on behind the scenes in terms of the descriptions for that as we speak. Of course, there's a real value with some of these pathological conditions in being able to understand not just the surface change, but also what's happening underneath. And this is also where there are parallels when you're talking about geospatial data from the uh, sort of context of geophysics perspective, for instance. Because essentially, um, we were able to take the CT data and the micro CT data and work with that. Um, Tom Sparrow essentially working with that from those original formats, DICOMA very much a standard for medical CT information. Um, and to be able to co convert that 3D coordinate data into the sort of data cube formats that, of course, you're quite familiar with in geospatial terms for geophysics information. And then to display some of that um, in, the, in the following way. So just here, an animation um, from this viewer that Tom created. This uh, a chondrosarcoma from the knee. So as you can see, the box that it's within tells us that this is a wet specimen from the Royal College of Surgeons. Um, and of course, a wet specimen wouldn't automatically lend itself to the sort of 3D scanning with laser scanning. So it's a, a useful way in which we've been able to incorporate other important specimens. Um, We've had, um, of course, you, you've got a sense here of some of the size of some of this data. This, um, uh, from that site in, in Wolverhampton, the 19th century site from the same individual I showed you earlier, right at the outset, um, suffering from this um, uh, sunburst lesion, which is um, characteristic of osteosarcoma. Very fragile data there, very fragile information. Not something that we could record easily either through 
uh, 3D surface capture with laser scanning, or necessarily because of the fine detail here through conventional medical CT. So this was something that we had to uh, move to micro CT and to again use other uh, forms of manipulating that data using uh, packages like Aviso Fire uh, to work with that. Of course, a lot of what we've done has been to work with individual uh, components. Um, and the benefit, of course, with 3D uh, digital um, work is that we can take that information, those fragile specimens, and actually do some of those digital refits in packages like Maya uh, to, of course, uh, replace uh, and reconstruct um, that uh, information. Now, um, we're still trying to um, uh, develop uh, all of this work and some work that's currently ongoing with one of our interns is to, uh, of course, recognize that certain pathological conditions affect more than one bone ele element. And what you can see here is her work color coding, of course, the models that are available for download and how they essentially fit together. Now, I've mentioned that, of course, a lot of um, the project was also about trying to think at, uh, at, at how we take this forward with various innovations. And um, Tom Sparrow, uh, known to many of you, I'm sure, uh, has been very instrumental in working with some of this 3D content. This um, uh, a, a, a skull that I'll show you in the next slide from Winterbourne Stoke um, that was 3D laser scanned, uh, ready for facial reconstruction. Um, and as part of that, uh, this was something that English Heritage uh, uh, got in touch with us about, recognizing our, our work with digitized diseases and with the, uh, the, the handling of 3D skeletal material. Um, and we were able to create this faithful 3D model um, that artist Oscar Nielsen was then able to uh, use as a basis for the, the chap that greets you at the new Stonehenge Visitor Centre. So a lot of um, useful work in trying to, of course, take this content to some of these additional levels. This, that specimen I showed you on the front of Don Altner's book. It's a specimen that relates to an individual with um, Kerry Sicker, which is a, a, a lesion characteristic of tertiary syphilis. We've got other examples that you're welcome to come and have a look at. Of course, these um, examples, both from CT data and from uh, laser scan data. But it's been great to see how this has started to um, be uh, of use to many um, and of course, if you can bear in mind that in the, in the US um, and, and Canada, we've got, of course, the issues of, um, uh, of limited use of skeletal collections because of um, NAGPRA and the like. So a lot of uptake, uh, a lot of um, visitors to uh, digitized diseases in the 18 months less than 18 months that it's been available. And of course, this is something that we hope will only grow. Now, of course, it's me up here talking to you as, uh, as the project lead, but of course, it's a project that wouldn't have succeeded without very many individuals uh, behind the scenes. Uh, and a fraction of those I've mentioned, uh, of course, today. It is something that, as I've mentioned, we are sustaining as a, a long-term resource, uh, part of our, our focus on legacy data. Um, and it's something that, of course, has catalyzed a number of other projects. You may have heard of Fragmented Heritage, which, of course, is the reason Tom is not here today. He's actually out in Jordan, and they're doing some uh, 3D capture, but at a, a different scale, at the landscape and the site scale. Um, and work looking at animal hard tissues and, of course, taking this potential of 3D digital data to inform 
um, those uh, who need to understand the characterization of materials, so customs officials and the like, working with endangered materials, um, rhino horn, elephant ivory, as you see in the, in the image there, that produce very characteristic changes um, or appearances in three dimensions. And much of this coming under the umbrella of Bradford visualization, which is, of course, um, something that has been helping even uh, folk like Mary and Hannah that you're hearing from um, uh, later, later this afternoon. So uh, to finish up, um, very many people that I, I'm not going to begin to start to name individually. I hope I've captured most of them up there, including uh, very recently uh, an intern, um, Romana Hussein, who's been doing some of this uh, work to help sustain that vision alongside Tom. And sadly, uh, in the early stages of the project, Don Ortner, whose book I mentioned in relation to that cranium, passed away. Don was a, 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 a staunch advocate of, of work here in Bradford, big friend to us in terms of human remains, big supporter of this project, was there at the outset helping us with some of that disease classification, and it's in his name that the resource is dedicated. So, apologies if I overrun slightly, but any questions are very welcome.